mushrooms basically, you know, there aren't petri dishes in the wild. So like they're growing in like a particular niche environment that's been created through other microorganisms or a certain opportunity that's been given to them. I personally uh, grow mostly Ganoderma, which are known as Rishi mushrooms, and I also breed Cordyceps, which are an entomopathogenic fungus. So entomopathogens are um, things that grow in insects, basically, which is also uh, very pertinent to growing plants, right? Because insects eat plants. Um, so uh, those are my interests for the most part, is on medicinal fungi. Uh, I started my company Trustro Fungi officially, I guess this year, but I've been kind of cracking away at it for the last 10 years, um, working on a lot of this stuff. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what you see here on the table. Uh, these are all um, here different types of reishi mushrooms, uh, mostly Ganoderma multipylium, uh, which is native to um, Southeast Asia, like tropical Asia. And uh, this is one of my favorite uh, strains of, or species of Ganoderma to cultivate. This is a strain from Thailand of Ganoderma multipylium, and all the other ones are a strain from China. Um, this is also Ganoderma multipylium, and this is also Ganoderma multipylium. So, um, mushrooms are incredibly uh, sensitive to their growing environment. So, if we raise CO2, we end up with forms like this, or if we don't exhaust CO2, we end up with forms like this. If we have more fresh air exchange, we end up with forms like this. Same, same culture, same strain of mushroom, but completely different growing environments. Um, so this is one of the, the funnest parts for me about working with these mushrooms in particular is getting to observe their growth forms. Um, essentially, if you could imagine this being the underground portion of the fungus and this being the above ground portion of the fungus, typically. Now you see the ends here are starting to fan out to produce their, their spores. Um, and that happens when a certain amount of oxygen uh, is reached in the, in the surrounding environment. So basically, since CO2 is heavier than air, the CO2 sinks and they normally have to climb their way out of that high CO2 situation. So if it's dark and there's a lot of CO2 around, they will stretch. Um, and so that's what I'm kind of manipulating in the growing environment in order to produce these uh, particular forms. Now, another really cool thing about Ganoderma and other facultative parasites. Um, so a facultative parasite is, is an organism that's not necessarily like a full-on parasite, but it can live inside of living trees or living organisms. Um, but a lot of people think that actually some of these facultative parasites are actually sort of like um, an immune system for the tree. So they're able to fill in certain areas where maybe there was damage or a pathogen gets in and they can kind of seal that area up. Obviously there's a lot of exceptions to these rules and there's a lot of gray area in between. Uh, for example, like Ganoderma zonatum is another species of reishi that grows down um, in Florida, but it's actually a huge problem in uh, the palm plantations. Basically the Ganoderma zonatum totally eats out the root zone of these trees. Um, so. Again, there's, it's not like, yes, they're parasites, yes, they're you know, um, completely beneficial. There's a lot of gray area in between there. And also there's over 300 different species of red lassate Ganoderma, which all these lacquered um, you know, mushrooms would be considered lassate, basically, because they have this lacquer coating on them. And this just happens naturally. Uh, some of them are more glossy than others, like if I was to wash the spores off of this one, you'll see it gets a lot shinier, right? Also the water helps too, but the, the spores tend to dull the color. <clears throat> so in, I believe it was 2014, I was helping um, a professor at the University of Minnesota named Dr. Robert Blanchett um, collect samples from Ganoderma from around the United States. Uh, for a long time, people have been calling all red lassate Ganodermas Ganoderma lucidum. Um, and so fungal taxonomy in general is really opening up like because of uh, the advent of DNA sequencing. So a lot of different mushrooms that 
200 years ago when people were first observing them and they didn't have the tools that we have now, they were saying, well, they, they look macroscopically similar, so we're gonna call them the same thing. So like most of the mushrooms that grow in Europe and most of the mushrooms that grow in the United States are actually different genetically, you know, because they separated at a certain point and they were able to delineate slightly from each other. And so now that we're looking at the DNA sequences, we're seeing more of these subtle differences. Um, so I was participating in this study. Uh, the study was actually just released last year. Um, if anybody's interested in checking it out, it's called Elucidating Lucidum. Um, and it's about basically all of the different species of uh, red lassate gamnoderma that we have in the United States. So it kind of um, put to end this assumption that they're all the same thing. Uh, so gamnoderma lucidum, which is people have, you know, a long time been wrongly calling a lot of other reishi mushrooms lucidum because the, the type species was discovered in the UK um, about, I think, like 200 years ago or something. And so this is actually a European Ganoderma lucidum that you saw with the really s strong red lacquer. Um, and so this is the actual Ganoderma lucidum. And for a long time, we didn't even have a lot of cultures of Ganoderma lucidum here in the States. Like, I had to really work hard to collect a lot of different strains from trades with people in Europe. Um, but we do have other members of the lucidum clade here in the United States. So other um, genetically related but still slightly different mushrooms, one of them being Ganoderma suge, which grows on um, suga canadensis, the uh, eastern hemlock tree here. And then on the west coast, uh, they have Ganoderma oregonensi, which grows on uh, the western hemlock trees. So at some point there was this big like glacial event that came down like the entire middle of the United States and that's when Eastern Hemlock and Western Hemlock delineated and it's probably when uh, Ganoderma suge and Ganoderma oregonensi uh, delineated from each other. But what's really interesting about studying fungi is that we know very little about like the evolution of how, how they got here, how they got to different places and they're, they're so cosmopolitan that even people can move them from place to place. And so we don't have a very good sense of like the history of these things and that to me is really fascinating you know trying to, to pinpoint like the story of how all these things happened um, so my focus is mostly on cultivating all of these different strains and testing and then releasing you know some of these genetics for commercial <laughs> farms around the country to use um, and so I grow I think about 30 to 35 different species of Ganoderma in about 120 different strains. Um, and there's probably about five to 10 of them that I like to grow better than the others. Um, definitely this Ganoderma multipylium is super fun and rewarding to grow. It yields really well. It grows relatively fast. Um, also Ganoderma sessile, which is in the Ganoderma resinaceum clade, and it's native to Michigan as well. Uh, I have some of it actually right here. This mushroom grows really commonly in lawns. If any of you have found reishi mushrooms in, in this area, like in Michigan anywhere, most likely this is what you found. Uh, they look very different though. This bag is holding CO2 inside, so that's why they're also stretching, like I mentioned earlier, to where they still think they're underground essentially, and they're, they're stretching to try to find oxygen to produce their spores. Um, so this, this mushroom tends to look really beat up when you find it in the wild. It can still be really pretty, but for the most part, a lot of the times uh, the wild reishi in the southern part of the state is pretty useless. Like you'll find it and it's like full of grass, it's full of all kinds of dirt and other you know, contaminants. And that's because it, um, it grows really flat across the ground. And I'm not sure if this is like uh, an adapta adaptation to lawnmowers, <laughs> you know, like in the last 50 years or so, like as people are mowing down these mushrooms, if they're just slowly selecting out the phenotypes that don't, that aren't as sensitive to CO2. And uh, I've noticed it across the board, like, cause I probably have grown about 60 different strains of Ganoderma sessile alone. And uh, every strain is different as far as its CO2 tolerance, which is really cool to me. Um, there's so many different phenotypes of that particular species. Like some of them have like a really dark burgundy kind of lacquer. Some of them have like more of a cherry red kind of lacquer with like a yellow intermediary band. So this changes a lot from species to species of reishi. This one's kind of hard to tell right now. Um, but normally you'll have like red, yellow, and then a white outer growing margin. 
but all of those colors change from strain to strain and even from species to species. Like this European Ganoderma lucidum, it grows this really, really nice kind of cherry red with like a really mustard yellow band with then the white margin. But the, um, some other strains might have more of like um, an orange intermediary band. So another thing I was, I was mentioning about Ganoderma lucidum and how it doesn't really occur in the United States, there are two isolated pockets where it does and we still don't understand why. One of them is in Utah and the other um, is in California. So we do have confirmed uh, collections of Ganoderma lucidum from those two places, but nowhere else in the United States. Um, and I've had the pleasure of being able to grow some of those strains from Utah and California. And the same holds true for those. I mean, the, the California has more of like a beige intermediary band instead of yellow or orange, whereas the Utah was orange. So to me, just being able to watch all of the different phenotypes is really, really fascinating. But then on top of that, with mushrooms, um, anything that they're exposed to in their environment, uh, they're having to develop um, new strategies towards uh, dealing with those things. So um, mushrooms will, de will develop uh, completely new antibiotics in response to certain strains of bacteria. So if you take a petri dish you know, of, um, of a particular mushroom species and you introduce a particular strain of bacteria to that, they'll start basically battling it out. And if the mushroom is able to uh, overcome that bacteria, you'll start to see the mushroom produce these little droplets of liquid. And if you analyze those droplets of liquid, they contain completely new compounds um, that the mushroom has created in response to this environmental uh, contaminant, and which is absolutely amazing. And it also tells us that even the same species of mushroom, um, if they're exposed to different, or even the same strain, if they're exposed to different environments, they're gonna produce different active compounds. And so this is something, you know, as we're moving forward, um, we're gonna have to keep in mind with, with, with um, mushrooms, because as much as testing has really improved in, in the realm of like cannabis and stuff in the, in the last 10 years, like it's pretty much unheard of in the United States as far as like for Ganoderma and for even Cordyceps, which I'll get into in a moment. Um, so there's, there's a possibility that in the future, in hospitals, we can have a bag of mycelium, and actually I'll, I'll express uh, this technique, I guess, and explain it, um, that we could grow a mushroom out on this block and then culture bacteria from somebody's stre uh, strep throat or from an infection, introduce it to the mushroom block, and then the, the mushroom is gonna produce metabolites that actually fight that pathogen right then and there. So instead of having to go through 20 years of FDA approval for a new antibiotic that is also over that 20 years we're developing antibiotic resistance and all of these other things here's a brand new antibiotic that can be used within a few days without having to go through that type of um, and so this is uh, what I'm speaking about now is uh, based on some of the work uh, by Trad Cotter he also has a really amazing book uh, called um, Mushroom farming and micro-remediation, organic mushroom farming and micro-remediation, but I highly recommend you check out his work. He's got, uh, he's able to work with like different types of pathogens and stuff, um, which is absolutely amazing. So he's actually taking all of, you know, his different mushrooms he's collected and exposing them to different pathogens and seeing, you know, which strains have the most resistance to certain types of bacteria. Um, to me, that's absolutely fascinating, you know, that this could be the future of medicine. Um, so uh, every, every strain has a different response potentially to their environment and their substrate and everything, and then also every, um, every species as well. Um, so if somebody wanted to collect metabolites that were being created in response to a particular uh, thing that you introduced, you could make a, a sawdust block like this, you know, and I'll get into that in a little bit, a little bit more. But if I made, when I made this block, if I had, before it colonized, if I made a little valley in the top of the, the block, that would be a perfect place where I could place something there, um, whether it's a soil sample that's been diluted with water or something or something else. Um, once I place it in there, within a few days, this bag is gonna produce a bunch of liquid and stuff. So if I extracted that liquid, that liquid would have antibiotic um, properties against whatever I introduced to the block. But also this is a good way that if we wanted to try to inoculate maybe an outdoor bed or something like that, we could actually prime 
our mushroom mycelium for the environment that it was about to be in. Because um, the other thing about mushrooms that a lot of you are probably aware of is, is the necessity of sterility, at least at certain stages of growth for the mushroom. Um, sterility is not crucial at every stage of growth, but definitely in the stage where you're working with um, media that is very uh, nutrient dense. So like things that have a lot of nitrogen and other things like that really require sterility in order for the mushroom to take hold and not be beat out by bacteria and other types of fungi. Absolutely, so that's a very good point. So again, if you're gonna strategize and like maybe you, you have to inoculate a bunch of substrate that you can't really like sterilize or you can't go through this treatment process, you could try taking a small amount of it and use a very high spawn ratio of the mycelium to kind of take over that bacteria and start giving it the tools that it needs to, to beat that you know, other organism. Generally what I recommend when people are getting into working with mushrooms, even though there are some viable low-tech you know, um, alternatives, I would recommend learning how to make um, sterile spawn and make petri dishes and different things like that so that you can work with the organism without all of that competition going on. Because um, it takes a long time to understand the fundamentals of the organism before you can start reinventing the wheel, essentially. So innovation is super important in the mycology community right now because there's a lot of limited belief, but at the same time that limited belief is based on uh, the principles and foundation of how the organism works. And I think that's the most important thing is for people to understand how the organism works and then innovation can happen, you know? Um, because people tend to only hurt themselves by trying too many new things too quickly without having successes. So like. Have your successes as much as you can by using established techniques so that you can give yourself more confidence and like the motivation to keep working on it. Because if you fail early on, a lot of people give up. You know, so I highly recommend that you start with techniques that are established um, so that you can understand the principles of how they're working and then you can branch out from there. With that being said, once you have sterile spawn and other things like that, you can do certain things, like I've mentioned, to start exposing that colony to different types of bacteria, to start training it and getting it out there into other environments. So first and foremost, when it comes to substrate preparation, sterilization is probably your best bet for success. After that would probably be pasteurization, which is heating it between 140 and 160 for an hour or two. Um, and then after that, there's some other techniques like cold water fermentation that work really well um, where you could take like wood chips or something like that and soak them in water for about a week, completely submerged in the water. And what happens with this type of anaerobic fermentation is you're killing off the aerobic organisms. And then once you pour that water off, you can inoculate it with mushrooms and the mushrooms are gonna take over like crazy because the normal aerobic organisms that they have to fight and compete with are gone. And so the one drawback to that method is you need a lot of space to do it because it stinks really bad. You know, it's, it's anaerobic decay and so it smells like dead animal or something, depending on what material you use. If you use something with a higher nitrogen source, of course, it's gonna end up smelling pretty <laughs> awful, you know. Um, beyond that, there's also log cultivation and also using log rounds. Slice, you can um, either use dowels to inoculate holes that are drilled into logs, or you can actually slice the logs into totems and stack spawn in between those. Um, before I go too much further in cultivation and stuff, I want to pass these around. These are what I recommend for people just trying to get into culturing fungi and even cloning mushrooms. Um, these are no pour petri dishes. Um, the, uh, there's a Ganoderma sessile sample growing on these that you can see. There's a little extra excess liquid inside of the, the no pour plates uh, because of condensation and stuff. There's ways to avoid that, but uh, essentially what what this avoids is having to pour the dishes in front of like a laminar flow hood or something like that. Uh, another thing that you could do with these no pour plates is you could put like a uh, injection port on it, like a, a silicone injection port or something for if you, maybe once you got the mushroom growing in there, you didn't want to have to open it somewhere because you're worried about contamination getting in there. You could um, inject it with liquid and um, 
basically agitate it and then aspirate the liquid out and use that as your inoculant. Um, what I would recommend, let me grab a little, so these types of um, totes right here, let's say you don't want to get a laminar flow hood, which is what I work on because it's the easiest and um, there's the most real estate to work under. But one thing that you can do to build a still air box without even having to make any holes in this tote, I can set this up and prop this edge up like maybe I'd put something under it. I don't even have to make holes and I could work under this and I would spray out the inside of this with alcohol and then I have basically a still air box and it's not perfect. You know, if you're outside and the wind's blowing and stuff, it's not good. So you'd want to do this in, indoors somewhere. Um, but then I could load a bunch of those no pour plates into here and if I had a wild mushroom or something that I wanted to clone or even another agar dish or something, I would take the mushroom, I would rip it open because the outside of a mushroom is always coated in whatever else is blowing around. So we want to get clean tissue from the inside of the mushroom and once we rip it open, we can use a scalpel. I'd have like a torch right here or something. Heat the, the scalpel up red hot. And then I would take like a rice grain sized piece out of the mushroom and place it onto that sterile Petri dish. So it's pretty simple. Um, it just requires practice. Um, and this is also a great way to preserve your genetics if you are fruiting mushrooms and you want to um, keep the particular strain. Or let's say you're working with a lot of multispore or something and you want to isolate a particular, particularly large fruit body or something. And then if you clone that and then you run it, you'll end up with a whole flush of similar mushrooms with similar morphology. So still airbox. I recommend starting with this. Um, if you can afford it, maybe build a laminar flow hood. Or find, there's also, um, There are also some um, alternative uh, units you can find on eBay as far as laminar flow. Uh, they, there's these ceiling filter units that they make uh, for hospitals and stuff. And a lot of the times you can find them. Um, just trying to think of a good keyword for you guys to search. Uh, I would look 24 by 24 like filter unit or something like that. And a lot of times you can find them pretty cheap on eBay. Sometimes they get banged up in the mail and stuff, but they still work really well. Um, so that's another way that you could be working with culturing different types of mushrooms. Of course, you know, you don't even have to do any of that stuff if you're working with, um, you know, injection ports and that type of stuff. But the problem with that is it becomes kind of wasteful with all of the, the plastic and everything and syringes and other things like that. Um, all right, so I have another mushroom I can pass around. This is another type of reishi. This is a black reishi. This is Ganoderma sinensi. This is from China. These, um, this particular strain, we had to work really hard to get this here. Um, I think it was about four years ago or something, we did a big collective buy from ATCC, which is like a microbiological culture uh, supply uh, place. But usually you have to have special credentials to order through them. So we found somebody who had the credentials and we did a big group co-op buy from them and then we ended up with this. Um, so that was really good that we got that. All right, I'm going to move on to entomopathogenic fungi, which uh, are fungi that feed on insects. So um, about four years ago or so, um, or actually about five years ago, I, uh, I somehow stumbled upon, I have a theory that it happened on December 21st, 2012. <laughs> I'm joking, but it, it was around that time. Um, that somehow this mushroom popped in my, 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 my consciousness called Cordyceps militaris. Now, a lot of you have probably heard of Cordyceps before. They're, um, they're hunted in the Himalayas and they're supposedly like, you know, they're worth their weight in gold and like these types of things. And they were originally, um, same with Rishi actually, they were originally like reserved for royalty and like these types of, you know, uh, legendary stories or whatever. Um, but we actually have 
um, a species of cordyceps that grows here in the United States and actually pretty much all over the world uh, called cordyceps militaris. And so uh, it looks like this, um, I'll pass this around too. People can get a good look at it. This is what it looks like when it's cultivated. So normally they grow in the wild on um, moth pupa that have buried themselves into like wet moss or sand or leaf litter. And uh, we find these uh, especially abundantly down in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and this here is grown on brown rice media with some other supplements. Um, this is a strain that I bred. And uh, when we first got into growing these here in the United States, the hardest part was finding genetics to grow. Um, even though they grow here, we didn't really know that yet. <laughs> we weren't really finding them in the, in the abundance. So like I was watching all of the forums and stuff on the internet like a hawk. Like anytime somebody was like, I found this, what is it? You know, like I'd be like, oh, that's this. Like, and, and so I was trying to basically find somebody that could either send me a sample to culture or somebody that was trying to culture a find that they found. And so I finally ended up reaching out to a few people. A couple of people were like, oh, I don't know. It's going to be worth a lot if I do it. You know, or like if, I, if I'm successful culturing it, it should be really valuable. And I was like, okay. And I was willing to pay it, but it was just kind of like the attitude they had was sort of interesting, you know, and exploitive. And then I stumbled upon somebody who was really gracious about it. And they, they shared their culture with me. And after trying many other cultures before then, that culture started pinning on, on the agar media. And I knew right away that I was going to be able to have success. So I jumped right into using um, a media that I got from somebody that I was conversing with in Thailand. Because in Thailand, Vietnam, China, even in India, like they, they're a lot further along with cultivating these mushrooms than we are. Um, and so I was finally able to get them to fruit. I think it was in the end of 2014 or something. And so I was probably the first person in the United States to fruit that mushroom artificially, even though there were other people doing it in other places. Thank you. Um, and so I had some initial successes. I was, I was going through the motions like I normally would do, trying to cultivate mushrooms. And then my culture stopped fruiting. Like it just wasn't doing anything. And it was also like I, I got busy with life and you know I was like focusing on other projects and then I, I got away from it. And so like this culture just like stopped fruiting and then I didn't have genetics to work with. So like I was trying to move forward with this and then I was at another standstill. And so upon doing some research, I found out that the mating system in cordyceps is sort of complex, you know, compared to other types of mushrooms. Um, so cordyceps are an ascomycete, which is more closely related to like the morel mushrooms or brewer's yeast than it is to all the other mushrooms. So um, basidiomycota or basidiomycetes would be the other group of mushrooms. Uh, so they fall into ascomycota. And so ascomycetes are really crazy. Also, most human pathogens that are fungal and plant pathogens that are fungal are ascomycetes. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so the mating system uh, is what's known as bipolar heterothalism. And it's basically just means that they have two sexes. So it's kind of just like us. It's not really that complicated. Um, every individual spore is only compatible with 50% of all other spores, basically. So in, for those of you that aren't familiar with fungal ecology and biology, it takes two spores, typically, um, meeting together and, and exchanging genetic information to produce a mushroom. The mushroom is the, uh, the fruiting body that's going to produce more spores, essentially. So like once they mate, whoops, <laughs> once they mate, they do that. Um, once they mate, uh, they then start to put all their resources towards producing this fruiting body. And um, this is true of actually basidiomycetes as well. Um, like reishi actually have four different sexes. They're tetrapolar, which is crazy. So if I isolated two reishi spores or, or one reishi spore, it'd only be compatible with 25% of other spores possible. So you basically have to run four combinations to find one fruiting strain. So with cordyceps, I can try basically, if I have two different spores that are of opposite mating type, I can test those to new isolates um, in order to test what their mating type is. And basically half of them will fruit because I basically half of them will be compatible with one type and half of them will be compatible with the other. So if for me to find 20 fruiting strains of cordyceps, I have to run 40 jars basically. Or I could do 
analysis on the DNA and look at the actual mating type genes. The mating type genes are called MAT11 and MAT12, and you need both of these in order to produce the what are called parathesial stromata. So the parathesia, if you if when you were looking in that jar, it might be circling around. I don't know. Yeah, it's over here. Um, the little dots on the end of these mushrooms are the parathesia, and that's what actually contains the the ascospores. So these ascospores are really amazing looking. When they land on a petri dish from collecting them, they just look kind of like a hair or something that has landed here. And this hair is made of 128 little circles that are called part spores. And every single one of these part spores is genetically identical. So if you get any, any one of these, then you have that isolate essentially again. So they kind of look like little springs. Like I think they might be like compressed inside of the ascus. The ascus is where ascomycete comes from. It's basically a little sack that contains the spores. And so these shoot out and then eventually they germinate. This is at a little smaller scale. So they germinate. You can see the different morphology of both of these. These are the same species, but they look very different. Um, so they germinate, they kind of look like a centipede a little bit. They look terrifying, right? I mean, like you wouldn't want that to land on you and colonize your body. It's, it's funny, people often say, you know, like I hope they don't develop the ability to live in humans, but I mean, how long has life been evolving? Like there's way worse shit that's inside of all of us, you know, like we're, it, it, cordyceps are the last thing we have to worry about. Actually, cordyceps won't fruit really beyond 68 degrees. So like one, that, it, there's, there's sort of these natural biological mechanisms that are built in as a control. Like the cordyceps don't want to decimate all the insects, right? Because then they'd have nothing left to eat and they wouldn't survive. So there's natural things in place to kind of keep all of these things in balance. We're seeing so many cordyceps down in Appalachia the last couple of years because the rain has been nuts. You know, like we've seen more rain down there than we have in a long time. Um, so all these things are connected. And then also the cordyceps, um, a lot of the species of caterpillars and, and pupa that they grow on feed on oak trees and other things like that. So they're a natural control mechanism to preserve the canopy in these old growth forest areas, which is really interesting. And that's a lot of the places that we find them in are established. They haven't been touched by people because they're in mountainous areas and they've been kind of uh, protected by that. So uh, my job is kind of to go into the, the deep gorges and bring them back out. You know, they like, they want to be everywhere now and they're, they definitely want to help humanity uh, with our health. So cordyceps are traditionally used um, for lung health and then also for stamina endurance, um, but also immunity. Uh, they make some of the best soup that I've ever had. Uh, they're not, a lot of people have cordyceps tea and I'll drink it uh, too, but it's, I wouldn't recommend it as a tea. It's kind of like drinking broth. Like it, it, it kind of tastes like chicken stock, like when you, when you uh, brew cordyceps, but it makes really good soup. Um, and so this is another thing I'll pass around. Uh, this is what it looks like when the cordyceps only has one mating type. Basically, it's sterile forms of the fruit bodies that don't have parathesia. Interesting. Um, I think there are novel compounds in mycelium. Uh, my concern with uh, a lot of the mycelial biomass products is just the amount of grain that's that's in them versus the amount of mycelium that you're actually getting. You know, because mycelium only really colonizes the outside of a grain. It doesn't eat the whole thing. Uh, granted, if you leave it for a long time, it'll eventually consolidate together. Um, but the other thing about grain in general is uh, depending, thanks, that's yeah, perfect. Um, depending on how the grain was stored and how, and everything, like you can have mycotoxins actually in the grain itself before you're actually growing mycelium on it and then powdering it and selling it. So a lot of people in the United States, because of the nature of how difficult it was to fruit this mushroom, they were getting those cultures that I was trying to fruit that I was not successful with. And then they'd grow them on rice, grind the rice and then sell the rice. And that was like their cordyceps that they were selling. And it's still happening to this day. And there are some studies that show that there are novel compounds in mycelium, even different than the fruit bodies sometimes. Um, but I'm not a huge fan of the, the um, 
the dosing and the actual potency of these products uh, in general. Uh, but I would say do some research on you know any products that you're buying that contain mushrooms to make sure that they're fruit bodies if possible. Um, and then also, you know, uh, if you're trying to, to find cordyceps, try to find maybe a farm that's growing them in the United States because it's a lot cheaper to get them uh, imported from China, you know. But um, I think there's a, there's a reciprocity to uh, supporting your local community, you know, or supporting a movement that's happening here where we can get this medicine, you know, um, being produced locally. Um, so, yeah, it, when that goes around, you'll see how... Um, it's not really practical to use the sterile forms uh, for commercial production. They're a lot slower, uh, less desirable forms. Uh, this is a wild strain actually from uh, south, southwestern Pennsylvania. And the wild strains really, they'll only fruit like two out of 20 of the wild clones will fruit for the most part. You know, so they're, because of the nature of those mating types, uh, when you're cloning a mushroom and you're trying to take this small little piece from inside, it's very likely that you're going to subculture only one of those mating types, essentially. So the same is true for like maintaining cordyceps cultures. You know, if you want to maintain it the way you normally transfer genetics, you're going to actually be potentially subculturing out those mating types. So you have to be careful that you're not excessively subculturing this mushroom. Um, another thing I wanted to get into, this is a different species of entomopathogenic fungus that actually probably has a lot more use for growers. Um, and it's called Isaria farinosa, and it actually was moved into cordyceps. It's called cordyceps farinosa now. Um, but with um, Ascomycota, uh, there, there's two different forms of fungus. There's, there's um, a um, anamorph and a teleomorph. An anamorph is basically the state of the fungus that doesn't produce sexual spores. They just produce like clonal, clonal spores that are called conidia. And so the, um, it's likely that um, Isaria farinosa also has a teleomorph form, but it's very rare. And so one of my goals now is working with Isaria um, to try to breed the teleomorph form. And the reason that it's difficult is also because this Isaria came up as a contaminant on a wild cordyceps clone. So it's not super common, but it's common when you're trying to clone them from the wild that they, they kind of compete for some of the same hosts. And so I would never open this in my lab. I wouldn't be caught dead. Cause like when you, when you see a Saria in the wild, if you hit it with a stick or something, there's just this puff of smoke that comes out of it. Like it's waiting for a caterpillar to just like walk by and nudge it a little bit. And then it just like covers in spores. It's crazy. And, um, so that's why I would never, uh, open it in my lab, which kind of makes it a little bit difficult to work with breeding it and stuff because I don't even want it in my lab. The only reason I grew this was because it came up as a contaminant. I was like, oh, that's cool. But again, it's one of my goals is to try to breed the teleomorph form of this fungus. Um, but one really cool thing about Asaria is that it actually mummifies fungus gnats, which we all hate them. So that's really great. Um, and then also like white flies and a lot of like thrips, a lot of other organisms that uh, can be fought off with uh, Isaria. Um, so that's really interesting. You know, there are some people that offer Isaria cultures. I can, if somebody reaches out to me, I'll sometimes offer it up. It's not something I regularly list on my site or anything, but um, this one definitely shows more promise as far as targeting particular pest insects in a garden or something. And maybe even just having it in your soil would be really beneficial. So that's the other thing about a lot of these organisms is we mostly see them like this. But if we do like soil dilution plates uh, where we take a little bit of soil and put it into water and then dilute that several times um, and put that on petri dishes, we find all different kinds of mushrooms, you know, that live inside the soil. Um, which brings me on to another point about Ganoderma and other facultative parasites um, that grow inside of trees. They actually need to produce cytokinins and other types of growth regulators to keep their hosts alive. So these types of compounds become very beneficial in gardening as well. Um, I know Gage is offering a, um, a mushroom extract product for, um, for plants, which is awesome. Uh, that the industry is starting to go in that direction because I've, I see people that are resistant to this concept all the time and it's really funny because if you just look, there's, there's so many peer-reviewed articles that prove this concept and like if you just look in the forest and see the logs that are breaking down and feeding metabolites down to the roots of plants, I mean it's really simple. 
Um, but definitely plants can eat mushroom compounds, you know, and if not, then the bacteria eat the mushroom compounds and feed it to the plants. So I would recommend if you're going to work with those, to try to stay away from secondary and tertiary decomposers and focus on primary decomposers, things that break down wood and lignin and other things like that into usable forms for your plants. Because if you're working with ter tertiary decomposers, for example, that normally are soil dwelling, soil is what plants use. So there's a chance that you're going to have some crossover as far as like what the mushroom is sort of trying to, to eat. Um, does anybody have any questions? So the specimen here, how long do these take to prove? Okay, that's a good question. Um, they <laughs> take a lot of times longer than most people are willing to give them in their growing environment. <laughs> so um, some of these take up to six months. Um, but if you're just cropping reishi, like to grow it out normally without the high CO2 situation, like certain strains you can finish within two months, you know, from inoculation to finish. So it's like kind of a week or two to colonization and then uh, a week or two to pinning and then about four weeks to uh, maturation. So it, as far as like quick crop cycles, I'd recommend Ganoderma sessile, um, which like I said is also native and that works, that serves a lot of people's purposes really well because a lot of people like to work with native fungi instead of something that's potentially invasive. Um, uh, there was another one over here. Yeah, so what was the purpose of getting the uh, just just for learning, yeah, just for research for the most part, um, because we don't really see it in the wild, you know, so I know that it's possible, and I just kind of want to... <laughs> a lot of what I do with this is like, this is like the byproduct. It's really like, it's like the, the fascination and like the obsession and like what gets me out of the morning doing it. Like, if all of this stuff was poisonous, I'd probably still grow it, you know? I mean... <laughs> Any other questions? How's reishi used? Uh, hang on a second. I was just wondering if you recommended any resources uh, for uh, learning more about the companion planting, like what types of species or what types of results people are getting with. Yeah, I mean, it's really just going to take people like people that are here just trying it because there's not been a lot of work done on that. I mean, there are some, if you go on Google Scholar, and look into you know that there are you know some studies that have been done in that like brassicas do well with with an elm oyster uh, it was actually a pleurotus you know oyster mushrooms are in the genus pleurotus so oyster is a possibility um i know that the build a soil who's speaking later they sell like spent you know mushroom blocks and stuff so also using the the mushroom substrate in your compost is wonderful you know i, I highly recommend that but um as far as specific things on companion planting, you can look into like uh, the Trad Cotter book that I mentioned. There's a little bit on that. And then also Paul Stamets talks a little bit about that stuff. Um, but yeah, we're, st we're still in the infancy of a lot of this stuff. And you're saying uses of reishi? Yeah, so uh, reishi has been seen uh, for a long time as like an immune support mushroom. Um, but to me, it's more, it has more to do with like the state of mind that it produces. Like it's, it's got a very zen and tranquil um, state of mind that it produces for me. And that's, I think, what I appreciate more about it. And also like just even the, the bioenergetic like um, uh, benefits that I get from watching the growth forms. You know, I think like it kind of reminds us of the beauty that's part of the world that we come from. Like uh, what I often hear from people is that like, oh, that looks like an alien. But like, I think it speaks to our alienation of like the ecosystem that we come from. You know, like these things are literally growing all around us. Stuff that looks pretty much just as cool is like out in the woods, you know, looking, waiting for us, you know? And so what's, what's cool about what, look, this one is, you can imagine like, this is like what's happening inside of the tree. And we're getting kind of a window into like what that looks like, or maybe under the ground, like it's, it's colonizing the root zone or something. And then it has to fight through the soil to eventually come up and produce this sporocarp, you know? Um, another thing, you know, like this looks a lot like the CO2 bags that, that people sell, you know? Um, honestly, I think you could get a similar benefit from like filling a bag with any sort of organic matter and letting mold grow on it. Like you're gonna produce CO2 that way. Fungi produce CO2. Um, I'm not talking down on those products. Like I think they're great, but I also know um, mushrooms work really well, but also all fungi produce CO2. Um, the other thing about certain form, types of mushrooms you might not want to have in your indoor grow room, 
if they're going to sneak out of the filter patch like this and produce spores. You know, because the last thing you want to smoke is spores, right? You want the benefits of the my mycelium of the mushroom, but not necessarily like dust on <laughs> all your flowers. So it's another thing to consider when um, incorporating, you know, fungi into this, into a grow or something. You're not necessarily like going to incorporate it in order to produce like fruiting bodies because the environment that you need to produce fruiting bodies is like 80 to 90 percent humidity. Like it will ruin your, your flowers like immediately, you know, so um, it's more about um, creating a similar type of environment as what we're finding in the forest, but not necessarily like fruiting mushrooms in the same area that we're growing plants. That's a good question. So these, I mean, the inside of these jars, I've had them like last inside of these jars like for over two years um, and like even dry out and sometimes I can kind of bring them back. So it depends on the ecology of the mushroom. So like mushrooms that live inside of trees generally, they can last almost forever. But mushrooms that are like tertiary decomposers, like I was saying soil dwelling fungi, dung dwelling fungi, those types of things, they tend to have to come back from spore more regularly. So like, again, cordyceps, they senesce within six to 12 months. Once I breed those two spores together, I've got, that clock has started. So I keep all of them separate. You know, I keep my spores, my spore isolates separate so that when I mix them, I can send them out to my clients or whatever, and they can have the longest amount of time with that. Except for if I just like shared the isolates with them, which I haven't gone open source on that quite yet. Um, Back to the question. Now, is there a way to collect those spores um, maybe outside the grow? As far as this, yeah, absolutely. There are a lot of different techniques for collecting those spores. Like you can use uh, water agar. So basically what I normally use inside of these no pour Petri dishes, I use like a basic malt extract agar formula, but I do it a little bit like thicker than normal. So I use like 35 grams of agar per liter and about 15 to 20 grams of malt extract. But if I was gonna collect spores, I would just use water, water and agar, basically. So I make basically a non-nutritive media that I could either um, attach the, this to the lid, or I could actually flip this upside down and put a Petri dish underneath it. It just depends on how many spores I'm trying to gather. The longer I leave it, the more spores I'm gonna get. Um, the shorter I leave it, the less that I'll get. And if I'm trying to isolate, I obviously wanna do it for less time. Uh, sometimes more distance too. You know, maybe I'll put this inside of a container and have it spread out away from where I'm trying to collect the spores to give it a little bit of distance, you know. What about growing, uh, any growing mushrooms outdoors and in with the, uh, with the spores uh, live throughout winter and grow next year as well? And that's going to depend on the, the species that you choose. Something like pink oyster mushrooms wouldn't survive here, but Ganoderma a lot of the times will, but also like if we look at mushrooms in their ecology and how, I gotta be conscious of time. Um, mushrooms basically, you know, there aren't petri dishes in the wild. So like they're growing in like a particular niche environment that's been created through other microorganisms or a certain opportunity that's been given to them. So the same is true for in your garden. If, if they run out of their food source, then they won't come back the next year. You know, so like if you've got wood chip beds that are established or something and it's fruiting doing well, if you keep adding wood chips, they're going to keep coming back. Now, if you bury a log or something, um, most likely you'll get a year out of every inch of that log, you know, but um, yeah, it really depends on the species. But for the most part, um, you can guarantee if it's like a, something that grows in trees and there's a, enough of a food source, yeah, it'll come back. It's like the, the fascination and like the obsession and like what gets me out of the morning doing it. Like if all of this stuff was poisonous, I'd probably still grow it. <laughs>